Alright, welcome back to another AQA A level chemistry video. Today I'm going to be doing a video on the shapes of complex ions. This is a very important topic. It's very short and very easy uh, topic to go through, but it's very important that you understand shapes of complex ions because they will ask you for the name of certain shapes of complex ions, as in uh, if whether or not it's a square planar structure or octahedral. You would have known about some of the names uh, if you did uh, physical chemistry year two. The names are on entirely new uh if you, if you recognize names like linear octahedral square planar there's not many of them but you just need to know uh what those shapes are and why the those shapes and it's important to know that because in the exam you may think to yourself i don't know what structure this is but if you know the type of ligands that are involved then you can easily uh remember the shape because it's, it's an easy one mark that you can get in your exams so you want to make sure that you get the most marks that you can get so without further ado, I'm going to get straight into the video. So complex ions display many different shapes depending on the metal and the ligands involved. So geometries, there are four main categories, there are four main geometries for complex ions. So octahedral, which is commonly seen with small ligands like water and ammonia, like we've seen in the past. Tetrahedral, which is commonly seen with large ligands like chloride ions. Uh, square planar, which is commonly seen with metals such as uh, nickel, palladium and platinum and then linear which is very rare and only seen with copper, silver and gold. So I'm going to go straight into this one here. So the first one is square planar. Now in terms of uh, square planar there's one type of ligand that you there's one type of complex ion that you should know about and it's the one on the right here called cisplatin. Now if you do a level biology you'd know a lot about cisplatin or you at least know what it is and if you don't know what it is you should get to know it for your uh when you come in to do dna i think i did touch on it when i did do dna uh for year two physical i believe i should have covered it but cisplatin is an anti-cancer drug how does it work it just does a coordinate bond or bonds with the bases in dna so if you know about how DNA, if you know about how, about semi-conservative replication, again, if you don't do A-level biology, you don't need to know about this in too much detail, but if you do do A-level biology, it's easy to understand this. Once uh, the two, usually what happens in semi-conservative replication, the DNA splits, but this is during the interphase part, the DNA splits in half and it gets new uh, primers and new bases and nucleotides to bind to the other side uh, once it, after a split in half. What cisplatin does is that cisplatin goes in between the DNA strands. So if you have a double-stranded DNA, uh, it goes in between and it prevents the DNA from being able to split into two by having bonds between the, between the ammonia and or the chloride and the, the bases. And essentially, if because it's such a strong bond, it prevents DNA helicase from being able to denature the, the, the bonds. It can denature the hydrogen bonds, but it can't denature this in the middle. So if you can imagine this here, you have usual hydrogen bonds, usual hydrogen bonds, right? Out there. And then you have cisplatin, which is just kind of like here. So DNA helicase cuts through all of this but this bond here is too strong to break and therefore uh, the DNA can't separate and therefore it can't lead to semi-conservative replication and that will prevent, that would prevent uh, mitosis essentially. It would, if you, and if you prevent mitosis of cancer cells, then that cancer cell won't grow anymore. So this is the, you target this towards cancer cells. This is part of a chemotherapy. This is a, this is a chemotherapy drug. Or chemo drug, right? Now you don't need to know necessarily about how it works, or too much into like how it works in semi-conservative replication. But all you need to know is that it's a, it's an anti-cancer drug, and that it works by binding, uh, to the bases, and it, it moves in between the strands of DNA, and it binds to the bases and prevents, uh, the DNA from being able to split. That's all it does. But uh, in terms of the structure of it. 
it's a, as I said before, it is a tetric to a square planar structure or square planar complex. And square planar complexes are usually often only seen for metals such as nickel, palladium, platinum. And the reasons for this are complex, I'm not going to get into those. But square com square planar complexes can can also have cis trans or Z E isomerism, uh, which is a geometric isomerism. And this is illustrated for the complex uh, platinum NH three two Cl two. So I can get this actually here. This this is a pla platinum NH three two Cl two is is just uh, cis platin, but it can also be trans platin. And if you do know about geometrical isomerism, cis or trans so uh, cis would mean together or susamen which is the z isomerism or and the transplatter would be the e or the intaken isomerism or e isomerism so and this would matter a lot because when you when don't suggest that these are the same thing that they're com two completely different drugs uh whenever they're doing chemotherapy they they look at the they 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 pick up specifically either cisplatin or transplatin, depending on a certain situation. Again, you don't need to know too much about that. Again, all you need to know about cisplatin is that it bonds between the bases of of the of the nucleotides, or but binds to the bases on the nucleotides and prevents the DNA from being able to separate. That's and that's how it works as an anti cancer drug. Prevents DNA replication. Therefore, the, the cancer drug will, will eventually just die. That's all. You don't need to know too much about cisplatin and transplatin. But all you need to do now is just know that there are different drugs. And the cis part ins insinuates that they are together. Whereas transplatin insinuates that the ligands are on opposite sides. See? Together. Opposite sides. So, to, together. Apologize. Together. And then these ones are on opposite sides. Great. So linear complexes. So that's that's for that. Those are the only square complexes that you need to know. Uh, linear complexes. So linear complexes are only seen for copper, silver, and gold. A good example of of a linear complex is silver diamine, and this is actually the ingredient that's in Tollens reagent. So when you think about, remember when you were talking about the aldehyde test, the test for aldehydes, we you can either use the Benedict's or Benedict's reagent or the Tollens reagent. I thought this, isn't there another one? I should really remember it. I haven't done it in a long time. There is one more. I forgot what it is. It'll come back to me. Probably won't. But it, but uh, the one I usually use is the other one, but. You can also mention Tollens reagent, and you need to know what Tollens reagent is, uh, and what the test is. But I'm using this one as, as an example of what Tollens. This is this is actually what the main ingredient, the key ingredient for Tollens reagent. What it actually does is that Tollens reagent gets, uh, it acts as an oxidizing agent. So when it's when it's reacting with an aldehyde, the reason why it's able to show a positive test is that when it reacts with an aldehyde, it acts as an oxidizing agent, or silver diamine acts as an oxidizing agent. It helps to oxidize the aldehyde into a carboxylic acid. But once it does that, remember this is a positive ion. I think one since it's an acting as an oxidizing agent, it gets reduced. Oxidizing agents get reduced. Reducing agents get oxidized. So silver diamine is acting as an oxidizing agent to help oxidize the carboxylic to oxidize the aldehyde into a carboxylic acid. But in the process of acting as an oxidizing agent, it gets reduced. Right? It gets reduced. And what you left off with, once this gets reduced, gains an, uh, some electrons. You're left of you're left of silver. Of course, you'd be left with probably some hydrogens to get NH four. But um, the most most importantly, when you, the part that, that the, the most important part of this is, of course, you're left with probably some. Right. Probably. That's not important. I, I in, in case there's a chemistry to that's look, looking at that, and that's wrong. Don't worry about it. I'm not going to go into that and make, make an accusation. That's wrong. The most important part is that you're left with silver because you've just, you've just reduced, it's just been reduced, right? And if it's just silver as the atom by itself, 
that's just going to be solid silver and that's solid silver metal hence why when you react a tolerance reagent in the presence of an aldehyde you get a silver mirror because that silver diamine has been reduced leaving you with just pure solid silver forming that silver mirror so that's what just a little bit of a fun fact if you if you wanted to know how silver diamine actually how tolerance reagent actually worked but um yeah, so that's, that's an example of a linear complex. So I'm going to go into some isomerism. So isomerism of complex ions. So complex ions display several kinds of isomerism. Cis-trans isomerism. So cis-trans isomerism is a bit like geometrical or EZ isomerism. When two groups are on the same side, they are cis. And when two groups are on the opposite side, they are trans. I've just mentioned this before. So the good example here is this example here, which is... Nickel H2O4 Cl2, right? These are both, these are both this essentially. Oh, let's write this down. Nickel H2O. Oh, sorry about that. H2O4 Cl2. I don't know what the charge on the nickel would be. It'd probably be neutral because of the fact that the CO two has a negative charge. If it's if the nickel is two plus, then it would be this would be neutral. But the point being, right? Um, they're both they're, these. These are both this, this and this are both this, but they're both isomers. And you guys know how isomers work by now. You should know about this by now. But it's just knowing that this would this would be an example of the one on the left here. I would call this the Z or the cis isomer, whereas the one on the right will be the trans. Why? Because I can see here from this example here, the CL, which is the only group that you can clearly tell where it's that it's a uh, an isomer, right? Is on the op. In this case, it's on the opposite side, whereas on the one on the left. The chloride ion, the chloride ligand, sorry, the chloride ligand. It's very important that we say it's a ligand because this is a complex ion. The chloride ligand is on the same side on, on this cis, on the left one here. So, again, just about knowing what was cis and what's trans. And again, it's written here. So, example is complex nickel, H2O4, CO2. The chlorine and water groups can either be on the same or different sides as shown. Cis trans isomerism is also very common in square planar structures, as I said before, with the cis platin and trans platin. And uh, but yeah, but it's also that's more for square planar. You get uh, geometrical isomerism with, uh, with square planar structures. But with you can also get optical isomerisms and octahedral molecules with free bidentate ligands exist as a pair of enantiomers. And this is illustrated by for a nickel comp, uh, a nickel complex below. Sorry, I don't know why I did put complete. Uh, fluid. But uh, yeah, oct octahed octahedral molecules with free bidentate ligands uh, exist as a pair of enantiomers. And this is ex illustrated for a, a nickel complex below. And the image, of course, is nickel ethane diamine. So the, the, the e, this EN free part, or EN, EN, the free is just how many there are, how many ligands there are. But EN is just it's another way of us saying ethane diamine. If you ever see this, then you have no idea what the hell that is. That's just ethane diamine. This the EN here. Good. So, nickel ethane diamine uh, three, or nickel nickel tri ethane diamine, I could say, has two isomers, and they're both optical isomers. And again, if you understand how optical isomers work, they they have the same structural arrangement but they have a different arrangement of those atoms in space in terms of the fact that they are non-superimposable images of one another they're, they're mirror images but they're non-superimposable images no matter how many times they're two they're completely they're different molecules in terms of the fact that no matter how many times you try to rotate this molecule you'll never get this molecule they are different molecules so that's one thing to and they may ha they may have sim they may have different properties may have different properties. All right, so that's pretty much it. So if I was just to round up all of this, so isomerism of complex ions. I'm about to 
give a little bit of a summary. If I was to say octahedral, so we can talk about both optical and cis trans isomerism, it can have both. Optical isomerism, and then it's also we can have cis trans. Or I prefer using EZ because that is. If you know about how EZ isomers were formed and why they're called E and Z, then I, pref I prefer using the word E and Z. If you understand a bit of German, then it makes it a bit easier, but. Yeah. Square planar is just pretty much only cis and trans, really. Or EZ. I'm not going to bore you guys with explaining why. I think it's an interest, interesting story as to how E and Z isomerism was actually formed. My chemistry teacher, Dr. Bakari, told me, shout him out, but he's probably not watching this. He's, he's probably just, he's not, he's not watching this. But anyway, there were common geometries. Again, so some geometries are more common than others. Octahedral complexes are most commonly seen shape. So you must be really, you have to be really familiar with octahedral because in my opinion, when I've done my exams, octahedral are like the most, commonly seen uh, complex ions that you see in terms of their shape but um, of course you do see some uh, square planar and linear examples as well but yeah octahedral six ligands and are often very small so if you're ever thinking of, I don't know what the shape is six ligands very small so more, if you see if you see six Six. If you say you have a coordination number of a six, it's octahedral, right? But mo most of the time, most of the co uh, octahedral uh, examples that you see tend to be monodentate ligands. But there are quite a few examples that you can see that are uh, bidentate or multidentate ligands. But uh, that's it. Thank you for listening.